also realize other things are going on, like this big volleyball thing. Three questions this morning. That an hour ago, Kirby had her gallbladder removed. Kirby, yes. She spoke to me yesterday. She didn't say anything to anybody? No, she didn't tell me. Yeah. That's the third time she's been in shit since January, and this school didn't have their gallbladder. Is that right? Chris had his. And like actually, her surgery's not so long. Like, yeah. Pardon? I heard that she was right before the last one. She told me yeah. yesterday it was at 10. Maybe it's on those 10. I, please. She talked to me just before she left yesterday, and it was about going on 3 or 4 o'clock at that point. And she said mm -hmm. 10 o'clock. Whether 10 o'clock was when she was going into the so it's not a, she, oh. not even an overnight stay. Yeah, no. It's just a surgical procedure anymore that they do. You can do all that. So hmm. keep her in your prayers today. She expects to be home by evening, and she expects to be uh, confined to her bed for a few days, and then she'll be. She said she should be back next week. So. Yes. Um, let me tell you this about the test. Is it difficult? Yes, because thinking is difficult. That's the difference between uh, having an objective test where all you have to do is just guess the right answer or actually think about what's going on. But the advantage of this is that I can give you a lot of leeway. All right, I'm not looking for right or wrong answers. What I'm looking for is your ability to think. If you can show me that that's what you're doing, then I'm going to be a happy camper. Or if you can show me that you've put a lot, you put some effort into this. One of the big, big problems in colleges and universities today is that students are not taught to think or to use critical thinking skills. This is the next big thing that politicians are going to be hammering on, and you will hear a lot about it. I'm just ahead of the eight ball right now. Okay, and that's why I'm doing this. If you don't like to think, then you probably shouldn't be in college because college calls for a lot of complex thinking skills. Just do your best. You'd be surprised what a wonderful grader I am. Okay? So, right, and remember that that, that is due by midnight tonight. I sort of expected to see some in there this morning. Do not, do not wait. Do not wait until 1155 uh, to start working on. Whoa. That would be. All right. We have a special guest lecturer today. The future Professor Greenlee, and I, <laughs> from time to time, I do think it's important to give students a chance to practice their skills. So that's what we're going to do today. He's going to do um, a talk about intelligence, mainly different types of intelligence, uh, some of which you've already read about, and he may throw us a few surprises too. So. Give him your full attention, and this is the future professor, Thomas Greenlee. So, mm -hmm. Professor Greenlee. I'd like to thank you all for coming today, but frankly, I wish a couple of you had skipped so the class size would be small. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I don't need more information. Oh, there you go. I've got my lesson plan on my computer. Um, today what I'm doing... Oh, no, I'm good, thank you. What I'd like to do today is make sure that you have lots of paper out because I want to have you guys draw some pictures. And that's going to be the goal today. 
You're going to be drawing a few different pictures that will help you kind of process what we're learning. So, we're going to be talking about intelligence, theory, and measurement. Let me double check that my crayons work. Excellent. All right. What? It's crayon. It's flush. It's dry erase crayon. All right. Can you use those regular crayons too? I'm sure we can. Who remembers the IQ test? What did you guys think about the IQ test? Did you take it when you were a kid? Anything like that? What did you think about it? How did it make you feel when you took it? Stupid. It doesn't still make you feel stupid, does it? That's cool. Because there's something that's very interesting about the IQ test. It was actually, this isn't the original of what it was intended to be. What you think of as the IQ test is really called the Stanford Binet. The Stanford Binet IQ test. And what happened was, there was this guy named Binet. His name was actually Alfred Binet. It wasn't just Binet. And he had this idea. He was called on to help, but to see if he could find a way to measure how kids were doing in school so that they could do better. His goal was to make kids better. At school. All right, I'm just gonna draw a little schoolhouse. Make kids better at school. So what happens here is, we have Binet, and he has this idea. We can't label the kids, because what we're not trying to make them feel bad. We're trying to get them to do better at school. So let's measure where they are, and then get them closer. So that happened in about 1904. I just realized I'm a terrible big letter writer. So what happened, though, is that he made this test. It didn't have many results. They just look at these just random results that came up, how they answer questions, say, what do you do better on? This guy Stanford, well, he isn't actually Stanford. His name is Lewis Terman. Why is it called Stanford? Because Lewis Terman was from Stanford. And he got this idea that he actually got from this German named William Stern in 1912. So, he turned out this IQ test, this IQ number, said, hey, how about we take kids and see how mentally old they are? Now what happened is, he said, all right, let's take this test Binet did and use it to see how old these kids are in their brains. So how old are they actually? And how old are they in their brains? That comparison is how much of a genius they are. You've all heard of this, the people with the IQ of 200. They think like grown-ups, we think, or like people who aren't even grown-ups. So what he has is that this idea of mental age. So we have here mental age. We have here no labeling. What's the mental age? A label. <laughs> so Binet over here is saying, what on earth are you thinking? And he's thinking, well, what I'm thinking is intelligence. I want to know how smart these kids are. So I'm going to stick that, see how they do in school. And that's going to tell me how smart they are. Binet's like, no, it isn't. Everybody can always get better at school. And of course, you can always get smarter, but there's so much more to it than that. Binet knew that, and Lewis Terman from Stanford did. So what happened was, they created two worlds. 
the world that he intended and the world it turned into. One is the test, one is the IQ. So that's why we have the Stanford Binet. So let's see if I can erase this. And so that is your one picture. Does everybody have the picture down? Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go to a new picture. Oh, so I'm going to have to draw the picture smaller. So what we have going on next is that people started thinking about intelligence. All right, if the IQ test measures intelligence, then what does that mean for us? We've got a big problem going on. How's this work? How does this work, this idea of intelligence? We're going to have a guy named Charles Spearman on the scene who has who notices something? Hey, you guys, who's heard of factor analysis? Oh, Dr. Werfel, excellent, I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> factor analysis is this way of testing that was just coming out in the early 1900s. So, this is all extra information while I'm erasing, but factor analysis is really cool because what it does is you don't have to theorize about anything. You look at data, look at things that kids actually do, and you figure out Okay, let's just churn out the numbers. So people started doing this in the early 1900s. They started churning out numbers. And the numbers they came up with all pointed to this idea. And the idea was, I'm going to save all that for later, general intelligence theory. So what we had going on was there's this guy named Charles Spearman. Charles Spearman, and he thought up this idea. There is, are two factors that are part of intelligence. And those two factors are G, the general. Kids tended to do better on tests. When he, re when he, test when he looked at a bunch of kids' tests, he would do a bunch of different subtests. And they would get about the same level all the way through. He said, that's weird. I guess that there's this ultimate, this kind of range of in general intelligence they've got. So that kind of formed like this line. This line, though, was based off of this was just all the tests put together. But there were all these specific tests. The specific tests formed things called specific factors. So there was one general factor that affected all the tests, and one that affected specific tests. And they formed this line. And that line went along this range so that these were kind of magnetic points pulling the line away from the general intelligence they've got. So two factors. There's the main line and then how it goes off of the main line. That is called the two-factor theory. This is the second picture. What happened was that someone looked at this and said, wait a second, kids aren't just generally intelligent. You can't just have, intelligence is so much bigger than this. There are so many different factors. People have different profiles of intelligence. Have you ever heard people say, you know, some, pe some people are excellent with maps, some people are excellent with words, and all that? This guy knew that. And so, this isn't Charles Spearman. This guy is Lewis Thurston. Now, Lewis Thurston had this idea of primary. We're going to all bring this together in a second. Mental abilities. What are primary mental abilities? Who can guess what primary mental abilities are? What he said was, 
you can't just have one G. That G is actually a P. And there's not just one P. There are seven of them. Etc., etc., etc. So, one deals with words, one deals with shapes, one deals with patterns. There's another one, another one, another one, another one. And there are all these G lines. And they each have their own squiggle. So, you can't just have one G, you have to have seven G. But they're P's because G doesn't exist. So, this is what he liked. Unfortunately, what ended up happening was he did some research and he found out that all of those seven G's, you can leave this on your picture. This isn't a new picture. You can just stick it on the side or something. They all had something in common. They all followed a pretty similar pattern. There was evidence that these were all seven lines, and they all had seven squiggles, but they all looked kind of the same in spots. They had some things in common. They had some spots where they stuck. So this is called a hierarchy. How many know the difference between a country and a state? Who can tell me? What's the difference? For you? A state is a part of a country. It's a part of a country. What's the difference between a county and a state? County is a smaller part of a state. So what's the difference between one of these squiggles and the collection of the squiggles? They're all part of something. They're all part of the model. They're all part of intelligence. So that intelligence is, there's this G going on, but then all along the G are different squiggles. All those different squiggles are the primary abilities, and they have some stuff in common. But each one is different. So there's specifics, so there's little specific points. Each one of these points is a specific. That's a specific, that's a specific, that's a specific, that's a specific. But what do they have in common? They all have a similar pattern. So the specifics are part of, the specifics are little tiny counties or cities that are part of the state. The state's kind of like the squiggle. And the seven squiggles are part of the country, the country of G, <laughs> intelligence. They're levels. And so this, what they emphasize is Hierarchy. Hierarchy is so important because when people do factor analysis, the people do factor analysis, they find data, but they have to stick it in a theory. So people find this stuff, and they they have thought up about seventy different specifics. People have thought of about seventy different specifics, and they, some people have thought up maybe like 12 different squiggles. They thought of 12 different primary abilities. But there is, there may be at most three of these G ideas, but there's usually just one. It's hierarchy. So what, is the, what does that mean when you're teaching in a classroom? What does it mean when there are lots of different things that people can do in certain situations, but they still have a general way of thinking. They have a general level of thinking. What does that mean? How, how would you apply that? This is a completely open question. What, hap what would happen if you were a kindergarten teacher? How would you apply the fact that your kid can be at a certain level, but he can do certain things very well and certain things not so well? How would that affect how you treat kids who have a lower G than he does? Just something to think about. Because we're erasing this, this picture. All right. Oh, this is what 
what I love about this picture. It's so easy to erase. It's just one solid line. I didn't think about that when I was making this lesson plan. All right. So what we had going are Thurston's primary mental abilities. But what happened is, do you want to memorize all those different abilities? No, it would be stupid. Nobody wants to do that except the theorists. And they don't actually teach this. So what we're looking at is intelligence. We may know there's narrow abilities. We may know there's broad abilities. We may know there's giant abilities. But what is intelligence? We still don't know. We still got these ideas. And we don't know where to connect them. People have been developing ideas, but there is a big thing. There's a big thing called intelligence. This is my very, you know, squiggly brain. <laughs> intelligence. There's this guy named David Weschler. And David Weschler had this idea. It's an excellent idea. I'm so glad he came up with it. That intelligence is one big thing. The, the meaning that he put for intelligence was intelligence, blah, blah, blah. the global, global capacity of the individual, capacity of the individual to act purposefully. So to act purposefully, to think rationally, and deal with the environment and environment. Okay, so what we have going on here is there's a global capacity of every single person. They act purposefully. They think rationally. They deal effectively with the environment. Each of those things is an activity of the brain. And so it gathers together and does all these things at the same time. Acting, thinking, dealing, acting, thinking, dealing, acting, thinking, dealing. But with an environment. What he said was, hey, forget this mental age. It's not that some people are older than others. It's that some people are more suited to different environments. That was a school environment. What kind of things are you expected to be able to do in school? Read. Read. Right. In, I hear in some schools you actually need to do math. <laughs> so there are certain things that are part of school, but there are also things that are part of work. What kind of things do you need to be able to do at work? Work. Work. Type. How about make decisions quickly? Take responsibility. What about persistence? Realistic goal setting? Work highlights different things than school does. Even though school is supposed to help prepare you for work, work's a little different, as you well know. <laughs> yeah. But then, the workaholic comes home. And suddenly, there's a lot of different things that are required of the guy who just came back from work. It highlights different intelligences. And then, the guy does a really bad job at home, so he has to go to court <laughs> and testify. How many realize that takes a different set of intelligences? All right, or mental abilities. What we have going on here is we have the same guy thinking but there are all these different environments. Who can think of some other environments that may be different? Church. Church. Excellent. Mm -hmm. 
How about war? There are all sorts of things that can go on, so many different environments, and they each demand their own set of mental abilities that are part of the global intelligence. So, he got that right. But you know what? You remember that Stanford Binet test? Oh, yeah, let me write. This is, to add your picture, global, and then underneath, put Weschler. It's Wetch Slur. So what we have going on, though, is that he said intelligence is so much bigger than school. But the place where you do the tests, the place where you're learning everything, the place where you've got all this going on is school. That's the thing. So that whole IQ test idea that Stanford Binet had, well, I'm going to take out the IQ part, but I am going to keep the test part. And so what I'm going to do is make my own test. Weschler made his own test. Yeah, erase terms, maybe. Um, Weschler made his own test, but you know what? It was a school test. So it looked almost very, very much the same as the Stanford Binet. He had some new ideas, of course. But the test was for school, and so he made it a school test. That's the difference between Stanford and Binet. Stanford and Binet was age, advancement, intelligence, and he said school. And there is this whole extra wide part of the globe that is the rest of your intelligence. All right, I think I can read that. So, let's see. So that Weschler test has a little bit of everything. He has a little bit of Thurston. He has a little bit of the G, of the G versus the S. He has, they have a little bit of everything. But there are some other ideas going on. Because some people are really innovative thinkers. And they don't like just taking what other people feed them. They like doing things on their own. So we're going to learn something by a guy. Oh. Does everybody have this definition now? For those of you guys who don't, I have my lesson plan, and if and I'm going to put my email address after I'm done with this, and then you can write it down and ask me, and I'll send you the lesson plan and the handout that I didn't get printed out. Very special. All right. So this is a new one. This is Sternberg. The name is Sternberg. William Sternberg. And he did his stuff in around 2003. This idea is the triarchic idea. Who can tell me the three parts of the triarchic theory? Oh, okay, that was that reading was a while ago. So there are these three ideas. There is there is creative. Creative ability is the ability to ad adapt to new situations, novel stuff, stuff you've never seen before. Practical. Practical is the ability to take everything you've done, everything you've ever learned, call it back and say, how can I apply this now? How can I apply this to everyday life? How can I apply this to convincing this guy to buy my product? How can I convince that, how can I use it to navigate this maze? How can I use this in practical situations? And then there's analytical. Analytical, you break stuff down. So, under practical, we have three we have three things that you can do to be practically intelligent. To be practically intelligent, 
You can adapt. Can anyone tell me how they've adapted to a certain situation? How did you come to a situation you just adapted to? It? Anybody? I think in school it's all like college and leaving out the games to the schedule and doing homework and putting them in games for you know family or friends and parents. And after a while you just kind of just do it. Mm -hmm. um, you think about what you want. Exactly. It's something that you you get used to, you adapt to it. But there comes a time where you can't adapt it anymore. And so what practical intelligence does is it will shape the environment. Sorry, the podium's kind of weird. Um, if you can't adapt, then you shape. Can anyone think of a time where they shaped their environment? Some, there was a place they were, and they shaped the environment. Okay, the shaping idea is where you're actually exploring. Before, this is conforming. Adapting is, all right, get into a situation. I'm going to do what they want me to do because I'm with this. I, I'm on this plan. This is a good plan. Shaping says, this is a kind of a good plan, and I want to be here, but I don't like the way things are going on. So I'm going to explore new ways of doing things. I'm going to explore different options. I'm going to push a little bit here. I'm going to take a little bit away here. I'm going to switch a, a couple things around. You know, this rule doesn't seem so important, so I'm just going to kind of walk over that very gently. I'm going to make it so that we go into new territory. Yes? I was just going to say, um, when I was a sophomore in high school, they were reading a book that, because of my testimony, I would not read. And so I decided not to do the assignment, and I was going to do an alternative assignment and if the teacher didn't like it, I was willing to do the zero. So. Exactly. That is called shaping. Shaping says, I know you want me to pick A, B, or C, but I can think up a D, E, and F, and I'm willing to pick one of those. That's what goes on when you're shaping. You pick option D, or E, or you know, option Q. So, that is the next idea, but there come times when the authorities catch you, be the authorities, you know, good people or bad people, and they're like, hey, stop adapting, stop shaping. Oh man, what am I gonna do? So, you, oh, what is the name? Basically go looking, selecting. So, you go and select a different environment. It comes to the point where you say, I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, we're not going toward the same place, we don't have the same goals. So instead of going to the bother of shaping, I'm going to select a new environment. When you're in an argument and you're not getting anywhere, sometimes you just have to leave the room. Sometimes you have to collect yourself. Find a new environment for yourself. When you've got an employee, sometimes you have to fire the employee, get, them, get a new one. What are some times where as a student, as a kid, as, uh, as a babysitter at work, wherever, that you selected a new environment? When did it ever get to that point? Um, where, when, in any time in your life, like when you were working, or when you were, hang or when you were dealing with something with your family, um, you came across a problem, when did you go and select a different environment? <laughs> I know I know in high school, like <clears throat> my mom and I got into a really, really big fight one time. Like and uh I left and stayed with my dad for a while. So I you know changed the environment. That's excellent. <laughs> the shaping was part of changing the environment where you were, and then you realized I need a different environment, at least for a while until things change. So you go and find a new one. 
That is called practical intelligence. It's saying, all right, I have this ability to break stuff down. I have this ability to make things work that are new. And now I need to take those and use them to help adapt and shape and select my environment. So, you know, there's this whole thing I could ask you about because these people have this idea that it's just a bunch of boxes. You know, there are these boxes, and there's this box, and then there's these sub boxes, and then you know there's little jobs that come off these sub boxes, little jobs that come off of those. But really, when have you ever met a task that you didn't have to deal with some new stuff, new or familiar? Actually, I forgot to mention this. You see, you got your picture still, right? That creative. That creative actually has a light side and a dark side. The light side is the creative. That's where something new comes up. You're like, what am I going to do? I've never seen this before. The familiar says, I have hit this tennis ball a hundred million times. I am now at Wimbledon. I know what I'm doing. My brain knows what I'm doing. And it's going to do it really, really, really well. It's going to do it without thinking. I'm going to be able to think about tennis strategy while I'm doing this, because it's so familiar. So there's the light side, which deals with new situations, and the dark side, which deals with normal situations. It's, you know, they're both good. But there's these two sides, heads and tails. And they're all part of this experiential coin. When you come up to an experience, is it new? Is it old? What are you going to do? Some people are better at one or the other. So. Is this point, point, point? No, because some people aren't so great at practical intelligence. The level, the size of their practical intelligence is pretty small. You know what? Their creative may not be that great either. You know, they've just got this little. But they, you give them a situation and they can break it down until there's nothing else to break down. They can take something and completely evaluate it until there's no more left to evaluate. What you have going on is we have these different profiles and they all depend on each other. So, creative, it has a size. Practical, it has a size. Analytical, it has a size. And this whole triangle make that look a little freer. That triangle you take into every single situation. So you're taking your triangle out into the world, so to speak. And sometimes you'll use one part of it, sometimes you'll use another part of it, but you're always using all of it. All right. And you know what else? There's this thing called memory. How many remember why memory is important? Memory is the fuel for this. Memory is like the little chunks of lines. This is like a, lot, a line chunk pile. And you add to this pile and you say, OK, I'm going to use this to build on my practical. I'm going to use it to build on my analytical. I'm going to use it to build on my creative so this triangle may change shape. But it's memory that fuels everything my brain does. Memory is very important. And just because you forget stuff and you seem to forget stuff a lot doesn't mean you have bad memory. It means that you're bad at applying your memory in that place. Just so you know, that was completely for free. You're welcome. So wisdom. There's this idea of wisdom. We've been talking about intelligence. But let's look at wisdom. Intelligence is how big each part and all of this triangle is in this theory. But Sternberg also had this idea for wisdom. Is wisdom just how much you know? It's how you apply it. It's how you apply it. What does wisdom involve? It involves decisions. It's not just decisions, but what you decide to do. Wisdom is how you decide to use 
your abilities. And it's not just how you decide to use them, period. It's how you decide to use your abilities for. How you decide to use them for your benefit. What? It's actually wise to do things for my own benefit? Yes, it is. It keeps you alive longer. Two, help others. Your benefit and others. Wisdom is every single one of these lines. Wisdom says, all right, how am I going to orient what I'm going to do next? How can I do things for myself? How can I do things for others? How can I do things in a wise way? That wisdom is a direction. Intelligence is the triangle with its three cooperating parts. And wisdom is the direction. How am I going to use it? Do I need to make it a little bigger? OK, I'll make it bigger with some memory. But how am I going to use that? So this is the triarchic theory that's going on. This triarchic theory insists on a dependent relationship. All right. Before I erase this entirely, you remember that whole idea that Thurston had of the seven lines and there are like seven squiggles, et cetera, et cetera. And this is G. And then there were a bunch of little S's and then there were the P's that were each squiggle and all that. You've got the picture of this. This is a highly creative question. But I'll guide you through it. There's a difference between these two theories. In this one, you have a G, and then you have the P's and the S's. But this one lumps everything under G. And G only applies in certain spots. But this one, this one says that the way that you analyze, how much you analyze, changes the way you apply. The way you apply things changes the way that you're creative. If you wanted to show the difference in these by putting them on the same model, then you could mix them all together by kind of going, that's a bunch of different lines. That's a bunch of different lines. That's a bunch of different lines. And there are squiggles in each. How many of you know that you're more that sometimes you're more creative when you have a piece of paper in front of you than when you have a piece of clay in front of you? That's right. So, when I'm creative, this part, this S, can be for paper, but this one is a deficit. That goes, wow, that's like a giant chunk out of my chart. That is clay. I can't do it. But, this affects how I think. So, this is big. You want, it's, easy to compare, it's easy to compete these two, but you can't, because they each show part of a bigger picture. Remember the global capacity view? Intelligence is one big thing. That means that if we see one piece of intelligence, of what intelligence is and how intelligence works, that means that somehow it exists. We don't know how, but it does. All right. We've got one more extra theory to cover here. And then, how, how am I doing that? Ah, all right. Oh, I'm going to leave wisdom off for a minute. I like that. So what we have going on now is there's this guy named Gardner. How many of you remember Howard Gardner? He's the multiple intelligences guy. How many of you remember multiple intelligences? There's 
this guy that came along, and his name was Gard. And he thought of this idea of multiple intelligences. Now you guys remember this. Okay. So this multiple intelligences idea says, what on earth are you thinking, global? No, it's not global. People aren't just one level, and people are at a lower level than them. What are you talking about? There are all these different globes. There's globes all over the brain. In fact, yeah, let me cross that out. That's confusing. That was the original idea of a globe. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. There are eight globes. And they all live in their own happy worlds. And so, there's a globe for patterns. There's a globe for images. There's a globe for language. There's a globe for sounds, making sounds into things that the ear likes. There's a globe for, all right, I have to go back and look at these because I don't have them all off the top of my head. There's a globe for other people. Some people have an other people sense. There's a globe for the self. Know thyself? He says, I've got a globe for that. All right, then you've got um, nature. All right, he took this idea of nature and said, some people are just crazy with nature. They can do things with nature that nobody else can do. They have, they're like the dog whisperer. They're like the people who can go and like touch a tree and tell you what's wrong with it. They're the people who actually will go and hug the tree when someone's going to cut it down. These are people with a nature sense. And then you've got the, oh, I'm missing one. Ah, bodily kinesthetic. It's because I'm so bad at it that I don't know. Some people have a body sense. So he says, Gardner said, stop trying to judge people. Everybody's got their own strengths. Everybody's got their own intelligences. <clears throat> Underline the S. Intelligences. All right, let's take a look at this. If you're really good at language, then how will you look at images? Can you think of something that's both that both involves language and images? Ooh. Excellent. Language and images can connect. Have you ever thought of something that involves both patterns and images? How about patterns? <laughs> Have you ever thought of something that involves both patterns and language? A poem. A poem, a word, a book. What about the body? How do you think the body can connect to language? How does the body connect to language? Sign. sign language. There's sign language. Okay. How do you think language can connect to the self? It's a bit hard because we don't know ourselves necessarily so well. We have self-talk. Self-talk. How do I know what I'm going through? How can I verbalize it? How can I tell what I need? How can I meet that need? How can language apply to sounds? <laughs> <laughs> some people, some people have a nasty voice. When they speak, you want to die. I fell asleep with this guy. There's this guy who, in my Algebra 1 class, <laughs> it, was, it was a video class. And this man had a southern accent that went like this when he was speaking of the quadratic formula. Oh. And he spoke endlessly. I fell asleep and woke up two lessons later. <laughs> that is a bad application of musical intelligence, sound, because we have ways of making our voices sound better, don't we? We have ways of making our language sound better. Mm -hmm. And that shows there's a connection. I don't have to have that underlined. I just prefer to connect with that. OK, what about others? We talk to others, don't we? What about nature? Language and nature. 
people are involved in apologetics, dealing with it one way about systems of information, but we can think about it as we talk to animals, don't we? Yeah. And sometimes when we talk to animals, it's a very good thing, isn't it? They love it when we talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. We found out that when you talk to plants, it's a good thing, isn't it? And you know, language may not be necessarily so great for that, but language isn't just about sound, it's also about meaning. And so there's, it's, the point isn't that we can specify this, but the point is that there are connections between just about everything. We've got patterns, there's ways. So how can this guy say that they're not connected? How can he say that they're separate islands when there are these bridges all over the place? Obviously something's up. Something's going on. So, I'm going to leave that up there because I have an idea. When we're looking at intelligence, sometimes we have a hard time telling what that is. We say, it's how you think. How do I think? I don't know. You just got stuff that you do. Some people are smart, some people aren't smart. No, everybody's got their own things they can do. How do you make it work? You're a teacher. You're, uh, you're somebody who's taking educational psychology for your own reasons. You don't have to worry about giant complicated things. You want to know what you can do. This is Mr. Triangle. How many of you remember Mr. Triangle from picture five? Excellent, good. Somebody has their memory going. All right, so <laughs> how many, so he's got this memory stockpile, right? And he builds himself up with it. So you're going to take that memory and turn it into a pitchfork. You're going to give this guy overalls. There's the pocket of the overalls. You're going to give him a farmer hat. <laughs> this is Mr. Triangle. And actually, he's not really a straight triangle. He's a squiggly triangle. He's got his squiggles. And every day, <laughs> and every day, he goes la 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 and he goes to whatever fields he wants to. He goes to his self, he goes to his body, he goes to sounds, he goes to language, he goes to patterns, etc. He goes to others. And he takes that memory pitchfork with him. And you know what he does? Each of these are fields, and they have plants growing out. Mm, yay! It's, it's, you know, some of it's corn, some of it's wheat, some of it's just flowers, but all of it is good stuff. And he goes there, and he makes it grow. And every day, he takes some of it back with him, using his memory. And so, he eats it. He eats it, and then he gets bigger. He turns into a bigger squiggly triangle. And bigger. And bigger. Over time. So he has to get a bigger hat. The fish fork gets bigger. He goes and buys a new one. But what happens is that he takes that as he's growing, he takes what he finds here, he takes what he discovers here, he takes what he learns here, he takes how he's added to by all these different fields that are connected together, and he takes those out into the world. The world is this whole marketplace. The world is this whole place where he hangs out with other triangles. Look at each of these arrows. These arrows are wisdom. What will you do with your life? How will you use your life to benefit others? How will you use your teaching? How can I become a better teacher? I can get better with language. How can I become a better teacher? I can get better with using sound, with using music, with getting kids to dance. How about with the body? How about with the self? How about with patterns? I can use these. I make decisions every day on how I'm going to make myself a better person to take out into the world. So every time I cultivate what's in all these different fields, these are my fields. This is how I work. 
this is stuff that I'm good at. It makes me grow in a special way, in a general way, in broad ways, and in specific ways. And then I take it out into the world, and I help other people. That's another direction. You can grow all you want, but if you don't take it out here, nobody will have anything that you have to give. So, what is intelligence? Is intelligence the squiggles? No. Is intelligence all these little fields? All these little places, these little areas that are connected together? Is intelligence the whole big triangle? No. Intelligence is all of this. It is not just anything. Intelligence is just how you, it's not just how well you think. Intelligence is just how you think well. You use this, you use your intelligence to be wise. And that is why we bother with intelligence tests, why we bother with school, why we bother with bettering ourselves, because we have a purpose. And that is one reason that intelligence is so important. So you don't have to agree with any or all of this whole picture, because this is my own individual idea that I thought was so much fun. I love coming up with this. But what is important is that you begin deliberately making decisions Intelligence isn't a static thing. Intelligence is how I think well. So how can I use how I think well to help myself think better? How do I measure how well kids are thinking? Very careful. And that <laughs> oh, right. Uh, if you if you want my if you want my notes, the lesson plan that has a bunch of the information on it, you can email me at tom.greenly at gmail.com or just go to your webmail and you can find my address under Thomas. Thanks for comparing me to a Scientologist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a great guy. I, I like him. So, does um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, good. And I didn't have any answer to what I already told you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do with all of these loose theories that I just? rattling around in your textbook. He did something that's very, very important that, that maybe you need to use these various uh, areas in your brain that we heard about to start trying to do the same sorts of things. Not just with you, but with the students that you teach. What did he do with all of these? He took all of these things and he did what? He tied them together in one. Uh, in physics, they're always looking for this grand unified theory. This is kind of a grand unified theory of intelligence, isn't it? And I can assure you that in the research journals, they argue interminably about these theories, and which is the right one. Okay, despite that, actually, let's give Tom a hand. I do outstanding presentation. And he's, some of you are aiming for first grade, second grade, third grade, whatever, that you can uh, draw a lot from watching each 
Patricia, this might be a good project. I would never force anybody to present in front of the class, but if you feel compelled, if you are extremely interested in a topic, you can start there. I mean, my classroom is your classroom. Let me give you a clue. The teacher learns the more than anybody else in the room. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> you learn more about intelligence that, than you ever wanted to know. Well, okay. So, so yeah. Very good. Very enjoyable. Uh, okay. For next time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this area of multiple intelligences, and you're going to have some. You see, we appear to have more natural ability in a certain area. I'll talk more about this in the, uh, next time. However, you will find that out. But the bottom line, okay, the bottom line is how are we going to apply this? to a classroom situation. And we're going to find out how to do that too. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to find out, hopefully if we have time, about what your learning, your particular learning style is. Uh, the textbook covers these because these are the things that you're going to find that make up for the diversity in your classroom and diversities among human beings. Uh, I'm not particularly stuck on the whole idea of particular, particularly intelligence levels or letting that sort of thing hold you back. Go for it. Don't believe the number on paper. Okay. All right. If you don't have any other questions, you are